Hello and welcome back. So a while back, we took a look at every single ending in the Twisted Metal series and ranked them from worst to best. It was an exercise in futility that nearly killed me. So let's do it again, this time ranking every single Twisted Metal level or battleground from worst to best. If you would like to see another ranking video, sound off in the comment section below and tell me what you think I should do next. And don't forget to like and subscribe and donate to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards. In all seriousness, if nothing else, please do subscribe. It's free and helps the channel immensely. Alright, enough shilling. Now, a few ground rules for this one. Each level will be taken as an individual ranking. Different variations will count as different entries, but reusing levels for bosses will count as one. Although there will be an exception for Twisted Metal 2012. I will also only be ranking the arenas. Challenge levels like Sweet Tooth's Carnival of Carnage in Twisted Metal 2012 or those side levels in Twisted Metal Head-On will not count, but secret levels will be included unless they're not available in the base game. Looking at you, City of the Dead. I will also be taking into account unique aspects of levels if it applies. For example, boss arenas. The arena itself might not be very interesting, but the boss fight may be fun, which will bump up the ranking. And the same goes for things like the amount of participants in the level in the main game, because less participants might make the level less interesting. I will also be including Twisted Metal Lost in these rankings, because as far as I'm concerned, it's a completed game as far as the gameplay, it's just the surrounding aspects of the presentation that were left unfinished. I should also mention that there might be certain inconsistencies on this list, because generally speaking, I will be more favorable to certain levels that aren't quite as good as they maybe should have been if they were in more well-designed games. Because a bad level in a good game is more fun to play than a good level in a bad game, because the gameplay mechanics are the most important thing for a game to be fun. There's no objectivity here. I'm only describing these levels based on the subjective amount of fun I personally had in each level. Now, I was originally not going to include levels exclusive to multiplayer mode, but you know what? I think I'm going to include them. You'll understand in a moment. Alright, is that it? I think it is. Otherwise than that, with all those qualifiers in play, there are 88 levels throughout the entire series by my count. I hope I got that count right. Technically there's more, but once again you'll understand in a second. Let's get this show on the road and hopefully get this done by nightfall. And I'm excited, because as I write this, I don't actually know what's going to place at the top of the list. Let's go. Every single multiplayer exclusive level. Because here's what's up, it doesn't matter how good a level is, if you can't even play it in standard gameplay, well I'm sorry, but any goodwill I could have for that level disappears immediately because you're essentially pigeonholing that level in such a way that I can't enjoy it in the same way you can enjoy every other level. You need another person with you, and even then, that's not the same as playing it in standard gameplay. It's just an entirely different experience. It's like they went through all the effort of making these levels, then you go through all the effort of unlocking the levels, or you go out of your way to find the secret code that unlocks them, only to find out you can't even play them like all the other levels. I think this applies exclusively to Twisted Metal Black, which has four separate multiplayer exclusive levels you have to unlock, and I went through all the trouble of unlocking two of them, only to find out that they're only in multiplayer. So it's a blatant waste of time. What was so difficult about just adding the unlockable levels to challenge mode? Nothing from what I could tell. Such a baffling decision. I even went out of my way to see if I could hack these levels into single player with action replay or something, and couldn't find anything. So until I can actually play these levels, they remain firmly in dead last. So continuing the theme of unofficial levels, this level from Twisted Metal 2 technically isn't actually in the game. It's a bonus level you have to unlock via a code, and it's technically also only available in multiplayer, but thanks to the magic of emulation and a little bit of action replay, you can experience this level as God intended. And it's not very good. In fact, it's kind of terrible. It's not a combat arena, it's an imported level from Jetmodo. I won't say the name of the level because YouTube has problems with that word, but it's a racetrack and design-wise it doesn't lend itself to the mechanics of a car combat game. There's a lot of unavoidable bumps, so you find yourself bouncing around like a madman. It's also very small, but somehow doesn't even make use of that space for this gameplay formula. It feels empty and lifeless in parts, with very little interactive set dressing other than a tunnel you can go over or under, and overall it just feels so chaotic, and not even in a fun way, in a frustrating way. 
It's not even an official level, but I'm glad it's not because it does not translate well from Jet Moto. There are other secret levels you can play via Action Replay in Twisted Metal 2, but they're just returning levels from the first game. When it comes to levels in this series, it's not about levels being too big or too small. It's about how they use their space. You want interesting level architecture, a varied landscape that allows for stunts, surprise attacks, and varying tactics, lots of secrets and unique gimmicks to make the level stand out, and so on. Washington DC in Twisted Metal 3 has none of that. It's a flat square with weapons sprinkled throughout and one elevated surface. What's crazy is they thought this level was so good it deserved the first boss. So you have to fight Darkseid after it's all over, which only serves to make you spend more time in this boring ass level. What a joke. This whole thing feels like a test stage they put in when they ran out of time, and it's not like it's a secret stage you can only access via putting in a code or hacking the game. This is a mandatory level with a mandatory boss fight. And the main levels you'll be playing through every time you play through the game should be where the developers put their best foot forward. And in that regard, Washington DC is easily the worst official level in the entire series. I will warn you right now, if you're a fan of Twisted Metal 4, you're probably going to be very mad at me by the end of this, because a significant chunk of Twisted Metal 4's levels will place towards the bottom of the list. Minion's Maze is a weird case, because it's one of the more memorable arenas in Twisted Metal 4, but more so for how not so great it is. Theoretically, a level should enhance the battle you're playing through unique and fun design. Minion's Maze is a rare case where the level's gimmick is so ill-conceived it does the opposite. The reason why is right there in the name. Having a maze-like environment is one thing. Having a straight-up maze is another. And that's how this level is advertised, so it was a deliberate design choice. When part of the level's challenge is even finding your opponent, that's an issue. The level gets in the way of the fight, and that's why it's simply not a good level in a car combat game. And for the uninitiated, one of Twisted Metal 4's unique selling points is that every level has a boss. A noble enough thought process going in, but all these levels take way too long due to a number of reasons, chief among them being the average level size being way too big and most enemies having way too much health, so having a boss at the end only prolongs something that already takes forever. Minion's Maze itself was a noble attempt, but with execution that's just... yikes. I'm not trying to pick on Twisted Metal 4, but there's a reason why I consider it the overall worst game in the series. One of the biggest reasons is that the levels just aren't very good. Road Rage, like many levels in the game, doesn't fully utilize its space very well. It's too open and too empty. So there's a lot of dead space in the action. Dead space in itself isn't bad. Having a level that's so big it's almost a majority dead space even with the maximum amount of players? Yeah, that makes for a bad level. You have these speed boosts all around which closes the distance somewhat, but the fact that you even need them in the first place is an issue. That's also the only unique gimmick in the level so it doesn't even do anything interesting to compensate for its shortcomings. This is the type of level where the fight takes three times as long as it needs to. It's ambitious, but boring. And the level isn't interesting visually either, it's just standard city streets. Sorry TM4, but hey, at least it only gets better from here. Interestingly, these next two entries end up this low on the list due to terrible boss fights. Twisted Metal 2012 is a bugger when it comes to this list because it's the only Twisted Metal game with a full linear story and so the line between special gameplay arena and traditional battle arena is blurred somewhat. Sweet Tooth's Carnival of Carnage for example is definitely its own level, but it's not a selectable level in challenge mode so I don't count it. Then you also have to take into account that each level has different variations. You can play in the main level, or you can play in several smaller arenas within the same overall level. Plus, because these are essentially several smaller levels condensed into one larger level, the main chunk is almost always universally too big. In theory, because even in the biggest arenas, you can have 10 separate AIs present, which almost always makes even the biggest battle arenas seem intimate. Although the AI is really frustrating because every single one of them will come for you and only you. So having 10 AIs is, well, sumo slide. So these levels are hard to judge or place. 
2012 is honestly the ever-present monkey wrench in these lists because it's so different to the rest of the series. What I concluded is that there are eight main arenas, and so I'm going to be judging them based on how the entire arena plays, but I'm generally not going to be taking off points if they're too big because of the inclusion of the condensed arenas, which I think is probably the best compromise. I'm also taking into account any notable aspects from the story mode. In that regard, I think Diablo Pass definitely places at the bottom. First of all, it's set in the desert, and deserts are almost universally boring to look at, and that's certainly the case here. It's also extremely linear to a fault, resembling more of a racetrack than a battle arena, which makes sense because a racetrack it certainly was in the story mode. But as a full arena, it has some pretty interesting set pieces, the town on one end for example, but it takes something like two minutes to get from end to end, which is somewhat overkill if you ask me. 10 CPUs in a city makes for some entertainment, because they can always take you by surprise. 10 CPUs along a several mile stretch of straight road. Kind of hard to populate that properly. And even then, most of these smaller arenas are just chunks of that two mile stretch. But Diablo Pass gets knocked way down because it's the level where you fight Iron Maiden. It feels like the universe flipping me the bird, considering this boss shares a name with my favorite band of all time. We would literally be here for five minutes if I were to go in depth with this boss, but basically it's an ungodly obnoxious boss fight that took me like 45 minutes to beat the first and only time I played it. I could just not get past the guided missiles bit. It wouldn't matter what level this takes place in, just the existence of this boss fight in this level kills it for me. But to be fair, this level wasn't great on its own merits. I didn't originally expect it to place this low, but how could I not place Diablo Pass this low when it's possibly the most infuriated I've ever been playing these games? So, I'm not gonna lie. Putting the Carnival from Twisted Metal 4 this low is probably going to ruffle some feathers, and it does kind of hurt me to put it this low, because it's so big, and there is so much going on. You have underground catacombs, a haunted house, several tents and attractions, a whole ass roller coaster, plus the actual look and feeling of a carnival makes for a fun and endearing aesthetic. But it's too big, possibly even the biggest level in the game. This is already starting to become a repeating theme and will continue to be a repeating theme throughout this list. A level can be big and good, it's just about utilizing the space well. But there are a lot of levels that don't justify their size. The carnival is just that. You can go minutes at a time without a fight if you try, especially with the busy scenery. And if you have to go out of your way to find the fight, the level is getting in the way of the game. But that in itself is not why this level places this low. No, the carnival places this low because of the boss you fight. Sweet, merciful Christ, this is agony. What's so bad about the Sweet Tooth boss fight, you might ask? Well, let me demonstrate. That was one attack. As soon as I was stuck in that attack, I was trapped. It held me in place and drained my health. There was nothing to my knowledge that I could have done. Stretch my face out with lips and call me Gavin, what the hell was that? It's the type of boss fight that's so cheap that only a small handful of encounters can drain your lives. It's easily the worst boss fight in the history of the series, and with the exception of Iron Maiden, it's not even close. This boss fight can go to hell, and by proxy, so can the level. Without it, this level would probably be in the 50s or 60s. Honestly, the only reason this is marginally better than Diablo Pass is its aesthetic. But really, you could swap the placement of these two levels, and I would be fine either way. I guess secretly I didn't want to have three levels from Twisted Metal 4 back to back to back. I was considering whether or not I should have both versions of the warehouse and Twisted Metal 1 in one entry, or separate them off. I decided I'd keep them separate because they're definitely different experiences, the lesser of which being what I've dubbed Warehouse 1. 
that being the battleground that everyone is fighting on in the main menu. It's neat to be able to play the battleground from the main menu, except the novelty runs out quickly when you realize that this is a completely, and I mean completely flat, empty battlefield with a dull aesthetic and absolutely zero weapon pickups. What you have at the beginning is what you have through the entire round, so you have to rely on your machine gun and specials. That combined makes for a really painfully boring level. Something like this would have the potential to be a Final Destination style true test of skill, but without weapon pickups, it's like Final Destination if you only had access to like one tenth of your attacks. The only thing that keeps it from the bottom is the fact that you have to go out of your way to even play this level, and it's only accessible via code. But it's still monumentally dull. <laughs> After these past two entries, I ask the question, is it fair to judge a bonus level that you can only access via a secret code with the same scrutiny as the rest of the levels in the series? Well, not necessarily, but a level is still a level, and I don't find Club Kid's house in Twisted Metal 3 very good. In fact, it kinda sucked. As this list will go on, you'll start to notice a pattern of me being favorable towards small battlefields, because it's a lot easier to have an exciting match if the battlefield is intimate, but much like big levels being bad, small levels being good is not a catch-all guarantee. Because Club Kid's house is too small, and there's literally nothing in it. It's a flat circle with a disco theme and weapons sprinkled around. But don't forget, I also have to judge a level based on how fun it is, and I don't find Twisted Metal 3 or 4 as fun to play as the other games at a base level, so these games are at a disadvantage to begin with. If this was in Twisted Metal 2, for example, the better feeling gameplay engine would probably elevate it by a few spots, but that's about it. All things being equal, no matter how you spin it, this level isn't good, and I can't say I enjoyed this one. It's just a big fat nothing burger. Okay, so Twisted Metal 4 has 8 separate secret levels. Holy crap. But unfortunately, they're all basically the same. There's unique gimmicks between them, but they all have the same bland art design and the same bland level architecture, so I'm just gonna do a speed round ranking them all in one go, from worst to best. Okay? Okay. Nowhere to hide, the pits, the islands, king of the hill, the citadel, tic-tac-toast, son of a ditch, octagon. I will not be offering any further explanation, cause otherwise we'd be here all day. Although it's funny, I will say that this series of levels kind of ended up being a measuring stick for this chunk of the list. It's like, I might not like X level, but is it worse than all those samey, personality deficient gimmick levels from Twisted Metal 4? No? Okay then, case closed. Funny story, when I was going through each game and tallying all the levels in the series, I completely missed this one, which really says it all. Hollywood is the opening level of Twisted Metal 3, and I don't know, this one's just mostly bland. It's a large empty lower area and a large flat highway road with a few ramps on each side. There are a few different elements to the design, but nothing you can actually interact with making this whole level feel very static. Plus, it doesn't exactly have the best aesthetic, it's just a destroyed part of a city. And I can't be the only one who got sick of Los Angeles by the third game, right? I remember the first time I went through this series game by game, and I specifically remember popping in the third game immediately after finishing the second, and I started this level and exclaimed, what the hell happened? And there are so many layers to that sentence. Outside of the urban myths, it's said that Twisted Metal Harbor City, later renamed Twisted Metal Lost, was cancelled because the lead director left the project. Quite frankly, that was probably for the best because maybe one of the four completed levels really have that same imagination or spark that you really needed to have the game be a worthwhile experience. Case in point, Suburban Terror. There's like, one interesting set piece in the entire level, which are these two ramps that lead to a homing missile pickup on this giant pizza. Otherwise, I can't remember a single thing about this level. It's just a lot of very disinteresting suburbs and like, uh, a bowling alley? It's just a whole lot of nothing, but I think what really knocks it down for me is a very unique issue. There's just not enough weapon pickups, something that very few levels in the series have an issue with, and usually it's only because of a smaller level not having space for pickups, and the respawn time being a bit too long, which is understandable and at least in a tightly designed level that makes you think on your feet, but this level is bigger and has a lack of pickups making it fairly unique in that regard. 
the amount of time I find myself looking for weapons far outweighs the time actually spent in the fight. This is one that definitely needed some work. Okay, so the 69th entry on the list this time doesn't really have a joke. I don't know, London 69, you can fill in the blanks yourself. You know what I really don't like about a lot of Twisted Metal 3's level design? It's just so flat. Very few of these levels have anything interesting level design-wise, and they also lack verticality or secrets. Many of them are just flat battlefields with architecture plopped in the middle. Case in point, London. It's a level that may trick you into thinking it's interesting because of how busy the battlefield is, but take a step back and you'll see it's an extremely flat, mazy environment with not enough interesting going on in the level design to elevate it, and it's too big with not enough going on to justify its size. It's just plain boring, and also features the most nothing burger fight with Minion in the series. Possibly the easiest and most ineffectual he's ever been. Talk about emasculation. You know, I was briefly considering opening up this entry by doing an obnoxious a cappella rendition of Transylvania by Iron Maiden. Couldn't tell you why, I probably would have regretted that as soon as the video was uploaded. Transylvania was a DLC level for the original version of Twisted Metal Head-On, but was later included in the full game when it was ported to the PS2 as the Extra Twisted Edition. Fun fact! Here's another fun fact. It's a level that can be best described as a whole lot of nothing. You can explore the castle, the surrounding grounds, and even hitch a ride all the way to the top of the castle, but I can't think of any one particularly interesting thing Transylvania does. It's just white noise, with nothing to enhance the experience, and I guess nothing to really take away from it either. Plus, I don't think they utilize the gothic feeling very well. It looks really murky. Is it bad? Not necessarily, it's just a really painfully unmemorable patch of a really solid game. It's always when I get to this level that I start to think to myself, okay, can we get on with this? The more I look at Twisted Metal head-on, the more I realize it really is a soft remake of both Twisted Metal 2 and 3. Tokyo Streets is very reminiscent of Hong Kong Crunch, but now in Tokyo. But I don't know, something about Tokyo just isn't very compelling as a level. Maybe it's too flat, maybe it's too open, maybe it's kind of an ugly level, maybe there's not enough interesting elements to the design, maybe it's Maybelline. All I can say, there's really nothing about this level that sticks out to me looking back on it, which is a shame because you have to play it three times per campaign. Which is honestly why it places as low as it does, just through sheer repetition. This is where you fight the two final bosses who are honestly chumps. Dark Tooth isn't bad, it's just a regular fight with a regular vehicle that happens to have a couple of attacks that will eat you alive, in one case literally. But then you have to fight Tower Tooth, and this is one of the most easily cheesed boss fights in the history of games. The whole idea is, you can't get near him because he has like, Tesla coil style lightning attacks that will damage you within a certain range, but because it's so tall it has a hard time navigating the elevated areas, so you can just sit here throwing pot shots at Tower Tooth, and it can't do anything about it. It's a really disappointingly easy boss fight for a series that has traditionally had hard boss fights. The more I think about this level, the less I like it. The design is fine, it just has a lot of little things that knock it down. Oh, this one hurts. This one hurts. Because Twisted Metal 1 is, believe it or not, potentially my favorite game in the series, at least from a gameplay standpoint. Assault on Cyberbia is the penultimate level in the game, and it's a big level. A big, big level. Assault on Cyberbia is basically just a large map filled with one-story buildings, a canal of some description in the middle, and some side streets on the outside. There's a lot of scenery, so I would never call this level one note, but none of it really plays into the level itself. It's just really big for the sake of being big, not because the aspects of this level couldn't have been done in a smaller level. So there's a lot of driving around mostly empty flat streets looking for a fight rather than the fight coming to you. As much as it pains me to do this, I can't lie, this one's pretty hard to enjoy. So here we have yet another level that's too big, but at least this one has some interesting ideas. You have multi-leveled gameplay with trenches, a small obstacle course to get to the top area of the shrine, or tower, or whatever that is in the middle, and two completely separate chunks of the level on either side of the shrine that could have been their own arenas by themselves. A lot of effort's gone into this one, but once again, it's just so overly massive that it gets in the way of the game. 
but at least it's not to the same extent as other levels. The art design is interesting, and the boss of Super Axel is fine enough. It's not a great level, but it's a lot more playable than some things that Twisted Metal 4 churned out. You know what's funny? As I sit here staring at a computer screen, I'm not even entirely sure that what I'm thinking of is the correct level when I say Watkins Harbor from Twisted Metal 2012. Because I feel like I'm getting it mixed up with Diesel City because they're both kind of interchangeable in my mind. I think Watkins Harbor is the one with the orangish tint, whereas Diesel City is kind of dark greenish. So yeah, as you could probably tell based off this half-ironic statement, this is a very unmemorable level. Off the top of my head, I can't really summon very many images of Watkins Harbor. It's sort of a nondescript industrial waterfront area with all that comes with, so there's plenty of industrial imagery to play around in, but not much of it is what I would consider very interesting. Plus, it doesn't look exceptional either. Aside from the orange tint, everything is just various shades of grey, which makes sense for an industrial area, but I'm also not a fan of the aesthetic. So Watkins Harbor is definitely not on the list of levels I relish returning to, it's mostly just bland. So, confession time guys. I am a shameless defender of Twisted Metal Small Brawl. Yeah, the setting and theming is ass a 9, 10, and 11, but if you're able to look past that and see this game for what it is, it's actually a really solid game as far as how it plays. And when it comes to the levels themselves, the batting average is a lot higher than you might expect. With that said, something's gotta go at the bottom, and for me that goes to one of the bonus levels, Holiday Havoc. It's basically just a Christmas-themed living room. There's very little interactive about the environment, the level design is very basic, it's mostly just flat with a few furniture-based ramps here and there, it's just kind of boringly designed and very static. I mean, Santa's stuck in the chimney and you can shoot him, but they didn't even bother giving you a bonus for doing so. You'd think that would be a no-brainer. Like I said, static and unreactive, something that Twisted Metal Small Brawl is usually good at avoiding. I will say, the level theming is at least pretty nice. I always get a kick out of Christmas theming, but it's all around just a dull experience and definitely not worth the amount of kills in the endurance mode you have to get to unlock it. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough, and you know the rest. Relatedly, I'm not a fan of Egypt in Twisted Metal 3. This level is a whole lot of nothing. It's built with various piles of sand giving the battlefield a wavy design, and it has two secret areas for you to find, one of which leads you to the top of the pyramid where you'll find an attack item unique to this level, the eye. If it weren't for the secret areas, this would have placed a lot lower, because the main part of the arena is just boring and way too open. But they at least tried with this one, and I can respect that. It also would have placed higher if it were in a better game, but whoop de doo you know, it really does become apparent when you take a look at the series in this light, but if you eliminate Twisted Metal 3 and 4, the series' batting average goes up like 20%. So, fun fact. While I was compiling all the entries on this list, I control x to this entry, you know, the cut command, but forgot to paste it back into its proper spot. So when I was going down the list, my numbers didn't add up, so I had to go through each individual game to see what I forgot. I found out that it was this level, and I'd definitely written about it, so I went back to an earlier version of the script to grab it. Then I was thinking of where to put it, and I chose spot 61. But it just so happens I was going back to readjust the numbers after they didn't add up, and I realized that I may not have miscounted, but just forgotten a level. So I stopped adjusting at entry 60, meaning I just so happened to leave a gap in the exact spot I ended up putting the entry. That was a weird coincidence. This has no bearing on the actual quality, I just thought that was a funny story. This hasn't really been apparent until now, but one of the things that Twisted Metal 4 tried to do to spice the game up is give each level a gimmick that they refer to in the loading screen. But they kind of give up on these gimmicks being interesting about halfway through and just made it to where they have a secret area with a lightning pickup or something. But level 1, the construction yard, actually tries to do something interesting. It gives you a crane to play around with. The Z-axis, to my knowledge, is fixed in place, meaning you can't reposition the crane closer or further away from you, so it's not very useful, but it's a neat little addition. Otherwise, this is a decent level for what it is. A main central area that connects several upper areas and contains teleporters to other unreachable areas. There's a lot going on here, but once again, it's too big for how many people you fight. So good design, but sluggish gameplay balances this one out as basically being okay. But being the opening level of Twisted Metal 4, it really was a shock to the system. Even more so than Twisted Metal 3.
Speaking of shocking, and isn't that a segue, Shock Therapy in Twisted Metal Small Brawl is a level that has a lot of ideas, but it's not executed the best. You have this hazardous ramp that goes to the upper level, and it also alternates sides, but you have no reason to use it when you have other means to get to the upper level. And the upper level has some hazards, but hazards that kind of exist with no rhyme or reason, and I don't think the upper level has anything so tantalizing that the risk is really worth it, so you have no reason to not just stay on the lower level, which is a fairly flat, empty void of nothing interesting. I like the theming, I like the design, but this level just feels like there's something missing, and the word that keeps coming to mind is cohesion. So Gridiron Gore from Twisted Metal Small Brawl is the level of all time. It's an incredibly large, flat level with a few set pieces sprinkled here and there. Well, two set pieces. These giant destructible helmets. But there's really nothing else to liven up the level design. I'm impressed they managed to render an entire football field end-to-end -end on the PS1, but outside of what I think is a ride-on lawnmower, it's just flat nothing. The end. Now slaying in Twisted Metal Small Brawl is honestly pretty mediocre, but that's to be expected. This level is meant to be set in a movie theater, which doesn't lend itself to very interesting level design. It's essentially just a giant slanted surface with rows of chairs capped off with a flat surface at the top and bottom. There's a single interesting set piece in this level wherein if you blast the popcorn cart, it'll roll down the center aisle and crash in the front area in the theater. I've worked at a theater and that job was terrible, so seeing this level of destruction is cathartic. But outside of that, there's nothing I can point to. It's just a basic level, and it's also the final level in Twisted Metal Small Brawl, which is disappointing. The final boss, piecemeal, is also a bit disappointing. It's incredibly tedious. Every time you blow up one of your opponents, piecemeal appears for a short scuffle and then disappears once you've done enough damage, making the boss really stop and start. I'd prefer if they just had piecemeal show up after the entire fight was over rather than dragging it out all the way through the regular level. So yeah, now slaying is just mediocre as levels go, but at least the game itself is fun, so it's not obnoxious or anything, just bland. You want to know why Warehouse District Warfare is one of the weaker levels in the first Twisted Metal game for me? Because I was genuinely going down a list of all the levels in the series and saw this one, and I could not picture it in my mind for love nor money. I couldn't remember any specific landmarks, any specific unique gimmicks, nothing. I kept getting it confused with River Park Rumble, which we'll get to. Mostly because River Park Rumble has the same aesthetic as Warehouse District Warfare, but has much more interesting and compelling level design. There's just nothing memorable about this level. It's not what I would consider subpar like Assault on Cyberbia, it's just average. But it doesn't add or detract anything from the gameplay, it's a pH neutral. This, I believe, is where I definitively place the point in which we're over the hump. We've passed the levels that underperform in any way, and from this point forward, we're starting with the levels that are above mediocre or are good for uninteresting reasons. Case in point, Stadium Slaughter in Twisted Metal Lost is a level that's decent. You have an arena area which is somewhat empty, minus a few jumps, and a parking lot area that's probably the most interesting part of the level. Hey look, garage doors. There's nothing that stands out here. It's a solid enough level that neither adds nor detracts from the gameplay. It's a lower end true neutral, although it probably would have gone up a few spaces if, once again, they added a few more weapon pickups. It's not as dire as Suburban Terror, but it still feels like I'm having to spend too much time looking, and the majority of the weapons I'm picking up are ricochets. I'm not gonna lie, Twisted Metal Head-On's levels were the toughest in the series to place because almost every single level can be described with the same phrase I would use to describe the game overall. Solid, but not exceptional. Case in point, Paris. Much like Warehouse District Warfare, it's another one that I had a hard time visualizing in my head, and after going back to it, I realized that's because this level is essentially a remake of Paris from the second game. It's definitely bigger in that the Eiffel Tower is in the middle of the level rather than at the end of it. There's a whole other half of the level, but the half that's a rehash is definitely a rehash, and the other half of the level is fine, but nothing to write home about. It's still a decent to good level, because the level it's based on is also really good, and blowing up the Eiffel Tower is always a joy, but this one is probably the least original level in the series. 
which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it makes Paris from Twisted Metal Head On a bit hard to get excited about. You know what's funny about the grease level in Twisted Metal Head On? If it were just the cruise ship, I think it would have been a perfectly fine level. But you have the whole surrounding countryside to explore with a lot of water around you, which acts as a pretty consistent hazard. Giving an organic tightness to the design as it relegates you to individual segments of the level or narrow connecting paths. As for the design, when you get away from the wetter parts of the level, it's very hilly, but also kind of nondescript at the same time. Nothing really stands out to any significant degree. But it's also by no means bad in any way. Yet another level that's competent, doesn't get in the way, and has a few fun tidbits here and there. Perfectly acceptable. Also, the environmental attack involves a statue of Zeus shooting you with his staff. Certainly something that fills me with murderous rage. So I was debating whether or not to use the boss arenas in Twisted Metal Black, because there's certainly levels where you can play the traditional gameplay, but they're also specifically for bosses, and as such are going to be built differently. I figured, since you're battling other players in standard gameplay, I might as well. Plus, you can play this level in challenge mode if you feel like unlocking it, and in that regard, Minion Stadium is not great. It's just the inside of an arena. You have curved surfaces along the edges of the arena, but nothing else. It's just flat and boring. Perfect for a boss arena, but when compared to the other levels in the game, it's easily the worst. But then the boss fight itself is actually the unique element that bumps this up several notches, because the boss fight is pretty great. Having to hit minion at all angles before you're able to damage the tank makes for a tense boss fight and a compellingly fun time. So while the actual arena is one of the lesser levels in the entire series, it's bumped up by having a compelling boss fight. That's more like it. Warehouse 2, as I've dubbed it in Twisted Metal 3, is essentially the same arena as Warehouse 1, the arena the characters are fighting in on the main menu. Except, this time it has actual set dressing. Boxes everywhere, ramps, a loop-de-loop -loop the game's engine definitely can't handle, and most importantly, items. Christ, this level is actually halfway exciting because you can actually properly fight in it. You can dodge around, blow up obstacles, utilize a bit of verticality. It's not the greatest level in the world, because it ultimately is still very flat and visually uninteresting. And lest we forget, is still a level from Twisted Metal 3, but it's a massive step up from Warehouse 1. Highway Loop in Twisted Metal Black is a tough one to place for me. It's essentially a giant donut-shaped level with, like, two interesting set pieces. It has a ramp, and also has a couple of roads overlapping each other. It's pretty similar to a level from the first game, which we'll be discussing in a moment, but something about Highway Loop just doesn't quite click with me the way I feel it should. It's still a fine enough level that provides some good action, and the narrow playable area means that there's nowhere to run, so you're always in the thick of it. And it's also fairly unique level design-wise, in that you don't get too many outright linear levels in the Twisted Metal series. So it's unique, and doesn't get in the way of the action, but I feel like I should like this one more than I do. The secret unlockable area is pretty neat though, and it's fun to see people fall through the gap in the bridge. It's like, imagine having something like six square feet of instant death drop in the entire level and still falling in. So originally, I had this entry further down before I realized I kind of had to bundle it together with Highway Loop, given the fact that it's essentially the same idea. A big narrow straightaway shaped like a donut. So once again, anywhere you run, you're guaranteed to run into trouble. Once again, you don't get too many levels like this in the series, and once again, it does have quite a few things that break up the main design formula, such as a giant ramp or splintering roads. Also, once again, I feel like I should like this level more than I do. It's not a level I dread playing when it comes up. Not at all. It's just not something that I'm chomping at the bit to play when it comes up. So it's okay. It's pretty good. What do you want from me? The bedroom in Twisted Metal 4 is definitely the level that really proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that 989 Studios had really jumped the shark. 
But for as much of a mess as this level is, I can't fault it too much. It uses the idea of scattered toys and playsets for some rather fun level design. Slides to and from elevated areas, entire side areas built around the undersides of furniture, enough open space to keep things interesting, but not too much. It's not a bad level at all, definitely one I don't mind going back to in the odd playthrough of Twisted Metal 4. Given the game it's part of, I can't really place it any higher than this, but I've already hammered the point about the game's quality repeatedly. Carno Mall in Small Brawl is pretty basic, all things considered. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it, but it's the perfect neutral pH level where... That works on multiple levels, thinking about it. Where it neither enhances nor detracts from the action. You got some open areas, some elevated areas, some carnival set pieces, and some secret back rooms, which is near enough the only unique gimmick this level has. The theming is fun, it has a good size to enemy ratio, objectively it's about as middle of the road as you can possibly get. It's another one of those levels that's elevated by the game it's part of, not the other way around. Diesel City from 2012 is off the top of my head, I believe, this greenish one. Okay, this time I'm absolutely being a little ironic because this is definitely a step up. During the story mode, Diesel City was retrofitted to be a racetrack, so that means it has an entire highway system and a lot of verticality to its design, which I really appreciate. Plus, it also has plenty of secrets and interesting little tidbits to the level design. This is actually a fairly solid level. Really, what it comes down to for me is that it's just very visually boring and unmemorable. If they just went with a more interesting visual aesthetic, maybe some better level theming, this could very well have placed upwards of 10 entries higher. But it's still solid enough, and when it comes to replayability, it's not something I'd sneeze at. I think the Tokyo rooftop level in Twisted Metal Head-On is probably the lesser rooftop level in the entire series. Because, as you'll see, I quite like me some rooftop levels. I guess the guardrails around most every edge eliminates the imminent danger feeling that a lot of these levels have. Without it, it just feels like a standard level where you have to be careful about jumping, and the level design isn't very interesting, just a lot of single roofs where you have to knock down radio masses before you can get to the other roofs. Which is a neat gimmick, but each individual roof isn't particularly interesting. That's not to speak ill of this level, it's still a pretty good level, but it doesn't take advantage of the rooftop concept, especially compared to the other levels in the series, and as such, it comes across as relatively standard in the grand scheme of things. It's funny how in Twisted Metal 2 we had Antarctica, and then in Twisted Metal 3 they went in the complete opposite direction with the North Pole. I think the North Pole is the lesser of the two levels, but it's still one of the better levels in Twisted Metal 3. You have the central hub, which is Santa's workshop, surrounded by a trench and various hills. Then you find various secret items if you blow up Santa's workshop, including a lightning power-up. Try explaining that one to Mrs. Claus. I like the level theming, and the level design is multi-layered, if not super intricate, but it's fine enough for what it is. No major complaints, other than the one I've already gone over. Every time I hear Monaco being mentioned, I can't help but mentally insert the name Lewinsky, even though I'm fully aware it's Monica. Either that, or I'd accidentally pronounce it in the same way you'd pronounce Monado. You may be wondering what the hell a Monaco is. Sorry, Monaco is. That was a genuine mistake, by the way. It's actually a country along the coastline of France with a 2.1 square kilometer landmass, and as such, this level might be genuinely bigger than the actual country. It's a beautiful level, and the waterfront area is probably the most interesting part of it design-wise, but once you get into the city area, there's not a hell of a lot to write home about, because it's just a city. You have some fun interior areas, and the last thing they could be described as would be flat, or one note. But once you leave the waterfront area, the city is still decently amusing, but it isn't quite as interesting, so it's a level that can be described as half great, half decent. Neon City in Twisted Metal 4 is not too shabby. When you're on the ground level, it's definitely too open and not particularly interesting design-wise, but where this level really shines is when you take the train tunnel to the top level. It's fun to hop around on the rooftops and battle it out up there. Plus, this level has probably my favorite secret in the entire game. 
If you go to this little nook, blow apart the wall, and wait, it'll take you to a secret sectioned off area with a whole bunch of weapons. That actually took some pretty clever deduction to figure out. Of course, much like all the other Twisted Metal 4 levels, it goes on for too long, the boss at the end of the level is overkill, and I wish they could have taken advantage of the futuristic cyberpunk aesthetic more than they did. As it sits, the aesthetic is a little bit blander than it probably could have been, but overall, this is not something I have any problems going back to. This is one of the opening levels to the game, and I suppose they wanted to put their best foot forward. Big Blue Stadium in this case is not a level from F-Zero, but rather the opening level of Twisted Metal head-on. It's the quintessential level of Twisted Metal. A nice main area that's open but not too open, some back rooms and areas to explore, and the seating area to escape to. It doesn't attempt to be anything super outrageous, it's just your basic arena, and honestly, I can get behind that. It's a very fun, very solid level in a very solid, very fun game. And the soundtrack for this level is a song called Disaster Proof by the band Level, but Level with a capital V. It's a little bit too early 2000s butt rock for me, but it's charming enough to have an actual band playing the music, and this is a good enough level to place in the lower part of the upper tier in the overall series. The opening level to Twisted Metal Small Brawl is a solid level for what it is. The design is mostly centered around playground set dressing, so it's a relatively big square arena with lots of open space and a playground set in the middle to play around on, along with some other things like teeter-totter sprinkled around. It's a perfectly fine level, nothing to complain about, and there's enough going on here that it manages to enhance the gameplay somewhat, so it's a level that I would definitely consider a good but safe opening. So Warhawk's Rooftop is yet another one that's a bit hard to place, because the boss is great, but the actual boss arena isn't the most interesting. Much like Minion Stadium, this one's also flat and boring, but at least has a couple pieces of architecture and an instant death drop all around the entire arena. But yeah, as a level, that's basically it. If this were just standard gameplay, it would be pretty lame, but the boss itself is pretty sweet, having to disable its shields with the explosions of tankers before moving in for the kill. It takes some tactics, it's pretty challenging, and pretty fun. Probably the most strategic a boss can be in this type of setup. It's just, you know, the level design is unfortunately not up to snuff compared to the main levels, but still overall, solid level. Deathport in Twisted Metal Lost feels like a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater level off its depression medication, and also sounds like somebody with a severe lisp trying to say desperate. This is a neat little level, and despite never making it to the main series, I kinda wish this kind of concept did. A multi-level cargo ship with multiple other ships nearby that you can ramp to and fight on. Thankfully, this is in the later series when falling off isn't an instant kill, but rather just does a fair bit of damage, so the falling hazard creates an atmosphere of danger that complements the action, but not so much that it becomes frustrating. If this were in a main series release, it would definitely have earned its place. I just kinda wish the cargo ships outside of the main one had a little bit more elevation to them. Once you ramp onto them, there's not much else you can do, but that's about it. Otherwise, it's pretty good. I do like me some River Park Rumble from the very first game. It's two halves of a downtown area split up by a shallow river in the middle of the level, so it's more like two mini-levels crammed together. And with that, a lot more people to fight. This is the perfect level for a strategy built around tactically retreating. Because if things aren't going well with one side, you can always run away to the other side, but you'll inevitably run into people who are hanging out in the middle. It's a good size, there's a good amount of enemies, plenty of weapons available, there's never a dull moment in River Park Rumble. I do like me some downtown from Twisted Metal Black. It's two halves of a downtown area split up by a shallow river in the middle of the- Wait a minute, we've done this one before. Yeah, Downtown in Twisted Metal Black is essentially a remake of River Park Rumble from the very first game. So I felt much like Highway Loop and Freeway Free For All that I would be remiss not to place them together. 
though I put black slightly ahead of the original because with the advancing of technology, downtown feels like River Park Rumble fully realized. Also, it has this really fun secret area that I never even realized existed until this playthrough. Twisted Metal Black continues to surprise me. For as much crap as I give Twisted Metal 3, Fair's Fair Hangar 18 is actually a pretty good level. It appears like a flat arena at first, but then you just blow up some panels and you can clear the way to a teleporter wherein you can get to the top of the UFO and ramp around to some platforms. This level has some good interactive elements and fun verticality that makes it a solid level overall. Plus, the level theming is ridiculous but fun. Having an entire arena be built around a UFO is something that spices up what is already a good level with good design. It's absurd, but in a fun way. It's a shame it wasn't better. I kind of wanted to rank it number 18. Oh yes, Los Angeles in Twisted Metal Head On. Of all the times that Twisted Metal has been set in Los Angeles, this is certainly one of them. I joke, it's a good level. More proof that Head On may not be the best game in the Twisted Metal franchise, but it's probably the most consistent all around. Though that probably has to do with the fact that, as I mentioned, it's recycling ideas from earlier games in a lot of cases. Los Angeles is no different. In Head On, it's a big open area with roads, canals, various buildings, you name it. You can even drive up to the Hollywood sign and blow it up. And I guess they weren't satisfied with just stealing from Twisted Metal 2 and 3, they also decided to steal something from Twisted Metal Black. Specifically the minion boss fight, only there you had to destroy various parts of a shield generator, and this time you have to destroy various parts of hillbillies. To be fair, it's an easy go-to idea for this type of genre, and a good boss fight worth doing more than once. It also starts out with steamrolling through a couple of ATV guys. I might slag this level off for being another rehash, but I had fun with it, and that's all that matters. There's a lot to play around with, and the boss fight was good. Los Angeles gets a thumbs up from me. And you will not hear me say that in any other context. Now, I don't personally have a grudge against California like so many people do. The only regions I have a personal grudge against are Philadelphia and Montreal. I won't elaborate. But it's hard to deny just how fun it is to blow up Sun Springs, California. You got a lot of destructible pieces within the environment and some very fun standalone chunks of the map, including an arena and a multi-level theater. Taken as a whole, this is plain and simply a fun level. The art direction is a little bit bland because it's just a suburban city with nothing to make it stand out, even though I do like the weirdly sinister looking skybox, but that's really the only knock I have against this level. I had fun with Sun Springs, even just exploring it can be fun, although if you do want to explore, make sure not to pick a 10 CPU battle. Trust me, you'll be ripped to shreds in seconds. Arena Duel from the first game was a tough one to place, because this is the first level in the series, automatically iconic because of it. But it's also kind of a fairly nondescript level, because you only fight one person and the environment that this level exists in is just a flat circle. Although it does manage to spice up the standard arena imagery with a sort of underground punk rock aesthetic. Which makes sense because according to the manual, this arena is literally underground. But the first level in the first Twisted Metal doesn't seem too noteworthy on the surface. It would have placed lower had it not been for the secret version of this level where you can fight five people. Now that's some lovely, lovely chaos. I'm a sucker for a small level with lots of people in them. So in that regard, Arena Duel is basic but damn fun, and the sheer iconic status of this level also bumps it up a couple of notches. On a side note, does anybody else have weird musical associations? Because I actually have a weird musical association with this level that I can never undo. I remember one time I was playing Twisted Metal drunk off my tits and suddenly had the urge to listen to the song I Might Be a C But I'm Not a F***ing C by Tism. Now I can't play that level without that song playing in my head. If you haven't heard that song, I recommend it. It's actually very catchy. Just don't sing it in public. Allow me to let you in on a little secret about how this video was written. I went through each game and ranked each individual level from each specific game from worst to best before consolidating the lists. And I had a real hard time with Twisted Metal 2 because I don't think there's a single bad level in the entire main game. 
Eventually, I came to the conclusion that I think the opening level, The Ruins of Los Angeles, was the worst level in the game. At least, the worst official level in the game. But it's still a strong level overall. You got the highway on the outer edge with a flaming pit to ramp over, a hidey hole, and plenty of open space to duke it out in. Also, it has one of my favorite musical tracks in the entire series. I settled on this one getting the wooden spoon outside of the Jet Moto level simply because Los Angeles maybe has a little bit too much open space, which can make it slightly uneventful, but it's by no means bad whatsoever. It just goes to show you how great this game is. Hong Kong Crunch sounds like a punk band, and one that I would totally start if I were a better singer. The final level in Twisted Metal 2 is a pretty damn good level. You're street level in downtown Hong Kong, and there's a lot going on, with a waterfront area, an entire subway system, and an entire indoor area that's intricate enough to have been its own level. And it's all capped off with not one, but two boss fights with Darktooth, both of which are enjoyable boss fights as long as you're willing to play a bit of cat and mouse. And thankfully, they let you start from the boss if you get a game over, which is good because doing all this on three lives with limited healing items would be a bit of a Hong Kong crunch in itself. It's funny for me that this level is on the lower end of levels from Twisted Metal 2, and yet still I can't recall a negative experience I had with it. I acknowledge these Roman ruins in Twisted Metal head-on as a pretty good level. It's fairly basic. You have two separate small arenas on either side of a coliseum with an underground cavern that you can teleport to. It's a great level, it's nondescript for sure, but it has fun design with solid gameplay. There's plenty of obstacles to play around with, and the Roman Colosseum adds some verticality. I can't recall any bad experiences I've had with the Roman Ruins. Sometimes, simple is good. You know what I like about Tokyo in Twisted Metal 3? It's one of the few levels in the game that does something unique. You're confined to the Tokyo rooftops because a volcano has flooded the streets with lava. So don't fall. Thankfully though, it's not an instant kill. It'll do slow and consistent damage. It's a fun twist that keeps you on your toes, but isn't too punishing. The main rooftop area of the level has a good size to enemy ratio with some fun set pieces and areas built to explore. Compared to some of the other levels in the game it's from, I have no major complaints about Tokyo. I could play this level anytime. Snowy Roads in Twisted Metal Black is a pretty good level, but one that unfortunately has to be compared to a much better level because you're given the option to play this one or another level for level 6. If you know, you know. So you might be mistaken in thinking that Snowy Roads isn't good, but it actually is. It's essentially two self-contained levels connected by a single path. There's plenty of ledges to fall off, it's big but not too big, and I always get a kick out of the lightning environmental attack. I guess it doesn't necessarily stand out from the pack when looking at Twisted Metal Black, because this isn't exactly the busiest level, but this is an entry to the series that has a very good batting average, so that's nothing to be ashamed of. Still, 95% of the time, I'll go with the other option because it blows snowy roads out of the water. Metro Square in Twisted Metal 2012 is yet another one that's hard to judge. As a full level, there's far too much, but the individual segmented areas that you can play in as individual levels are great. This is practically an entire city. You have a giant ice rink, several indoor shopping centers to plow your way through, and even an entire subway system, and I honestly don't mind flying into the sky and just taking a look around. It's definitely most enjoyed when you play around in the smaller chunks rather than the entire level, but it's a solid enough area with an appealing look, plenty of atmosphere, and a lot of detail. Definitely worth coming back to. Well, if you put a gun to my head and forced me to pick a favorite level from Twisted Metal 4, I guess I would have to pick the Oil Rig. It's a multi-leveled environment with pretty much everything you could hope for. Ramps, secrets, hazards, infinite drops, a quick means to get around, you name it. It makes great use of its space, and it's capped off with a double boss fight with Super Augur and Super Slam. If this were in any other game, it would probably be a top 10 contender, but it's still held back by the game's engine being really janky. Hence me being trapped in the floor for two minutes here. 
Not something that looks good on the permanent record. So yeah, a good level held back by the game it's in, but it's good enough on its own merits that it's able to overcome those trappings. This one makes me sad, because Russia in Head-On is one of the most intricate levels in the entire series. It has so many different gimmicks, ideas, and fun little details to the level architecture. Like how you'll find these missile silos all over the place, and if you activate them, you'll gradually open up secret locations all over the map one by one. I enjoy this level from a gimmick standpoint, and I feel that's why I couldn't help but place it this high. But like other levels of its ilk, Russia is too big. Well, duh. No, I mean, in the game. If you put in the effort, you can go minutes without getting into a fight. If they just tightened up the level design, or more evenly dispersed the more gimmicky elements, this would have been a top-tier level. But it's still one of those levels I find myself going back to, so despite its shortcomings, it's still a really good level. Definitely on the upper end of the game it's part of, as well as the series. You know what I like most about Easy Death Oven in Twisted Metal Small Brawl? If you shoot the guy fixing the sink in the butt with napalm, you'll unlock the underside of the island in the middle of the kitchen. I just like the idea of shooting someone in the butt to make progress. Yeah, really solid level. Nice open area at the bottom, a treacherous countertop with multiple hazards, including a toaster oven with a healing item, which is a trap. It'll shut itself and bake you alive if you're not quick. Then you have the island in the middle and some launch pads. Design-wise, it's on the more basic end for the series, but as far as making the most out of a basic fundamental design, this one really puts the work in, making it a very fun level with a lot going on. Definitely one of the highlights of Small Brawl. Carnival of Darkness from Twisted Metal Lost kind of reminds me of the Carnival from Twisted Metal 4, just without the horrible boss fight making it instantly infinity billion times better. Lots of ramps, lots of rides to roll around on, plenty of verticality. It's a bigger level, but one that manages to justify and make the most out of its size. It's funny how the levels in Twisted Metal Lost each occupy a completely separate part of the quality spectrum, rather than what most games do and have a steady increase or decrease in quality throughout the game. Suburban Terror was weak, Stadium Slaughter was okay, Death Port was good, and Carnival of Darkness is damn good. Suburbs in Twisted Metal Black, I feel, is the level that Assault on Cyberbia wanted to be. It's the same idea, it's a large suburban area, but the difference being that Suburbs, I feel, uses the space a lot better. Lots of rocky, mountainous terrain, lots of buildings to blow up, a lot of unique areas to play around in and find secrets in, and there's enough players present in the level that you will rarely not have someone on your tail, at least until you get down to the final three. It's a level that I always have a fun time in, even after 20 playthroughs. New York from Twisted Metal 2 is another level that's hard to place. It's a bit of a dog's breakfast of ideas. This level is set in the New York skyline suspended in a junction point between several skyscrapers. You have a central area with a two-level platform and a surrounding area filled with any number of different set pieces, both indoor and outdoor. It's one of those levels where I can criticize it for being too big or too busy, but there's no denying that I look forward to playing this level whenever it comes up. It's always a treat. Then there's also a good balance of tight claustrophobic areas and big wide open areas, so everywhere you go it's a different type of fight that you'll get into. It might not be one of the best levels in Twisted Metal 2 to me, but it's still a damn good level, and on the upper end of the series overall. Also, Statue of Liberty in a bikini. Ladies and gentlemen, the 90s. Thrills and Spills Park from the 2012 game has some things I love, but also has some things I'm not too fond of. But in the end, I had to acknowledge just how interesting this level is, both from a visual standpoint and a gameplay standpoint. It's one of those levels I wish I could just turn off CPUs and just explore. There's two entirely separate castles to roam around in and go all the way to the top of, as well as an entire theme park with rides you can actually ride around on. And you can individually section yourself off into a couple variations of this level, and they're all very interesting. 
There's a lot of interactability in the environment, and it feels livelier than it has any right to. You really get a sense for how much soul-crushing effort must have gone into this level, possibly more than any other level in the entire series, and it really pays off in my opinion. It's maybe a little bit too much razzle-dazzle and not enough actual substance as far as how that effort plays into the gameplay, but I still think it's a really solid level. You know what's fun? Mini golf. Or putt putt, as some people call it. You know what else is fun? Mini golf mayhem from Twisted Metal Small Brawl. It's a big level, but it has a lot going on. It's essentially split off into several smaller arenas built around one central piece of level architecture, whether that be a volcano, a couple of crushing mechanisms, or a big pyramid. Sink the ball, win a prize. Look at that. And the environmental attack is fun, making the volcano erupt. It's a pretty solid-ass level that I always look forward to, and it's all capped off with a boss fight against Trapper, which is... Eh, it's alright. There's a lot to talk about with this one, but it's a great level with fun theming and enjoyable design that makes the most out of the solid gameplay engine. So Twisted Metal 2 has two different levels that put you in a small arena to duke it out in. Holland is definitely the lesser of these two levels. It's always fun to have a small space to wreck shop in with not but your own skills standing between you and victory, but I don't know, this one's a little bit more dull because the level design is flat without much architecture or set pieces to liven up the design. But what really sells this level for me is just how many people you fight. With nine opposing players, it's pure chaos through to the bone marrow. So while the level design might not be much to write home about, just having that much chaos in that small of a space is enough, and unlike that level from Jet Moto or Club Kid's House from Twisted Metal 3, this is chaos in the best possible way. It may not be as good as some of its contemporaries, but fuck me if this level is not just plain, uncomplicated fun. Freeway from Twisted Metal Black is a level that has a surprising amount of depth. You got the main freeway, the arena, the construction yard, these buildings, but it never feels too busy somehow. I guess everything's in a close enough proximity and you fight enough people that it keeps the pace brisk despite its size. So the level design feels paradoxically tight despite how much is going on. You're never too far away from the fight. But there's also enough breathing room that you can tactically retreat to refill your health and ammo. So it gets that balance just right. There's lots of secrets, lots to explore, lots to find, lots of places to get into fights in. There's never a dull moment on this freeway, and I could play this level anytime. Man, who would have thought the song Frere Jaca could be metal as f***? Paris is a deceptively simple level at first. A city level with a few interesting set pieces. It's got a good size with enough variance to keep things interesting. Plus, like I said, the main theme is a remix of Frere Jaca, and I love it for that. But what really elevated this level is its gimmick. You have a few secret areas you can find, but none better than when you blow up the Eiffel Tower, which opens up the second half of the level. It creates a bridge through which you can explore the Paris rooftops. That's pretty sweet. Of course, this is a gimmick that was brought back later in the series, but it was very novel here. Plus, you'll never forget your first. So, for that extra added engagement, and otherwise being a generally solid level with nothing wrong with it, Paris ranks as a pretty damn great level. So naturally, the best level in Twisted Metal 3 is actually the final level. As a level, and I mean this in the absolute best way possible, it feels like it could have been in Twisted Metal 1 or 2. It's big but makes the most of its space, having several distinct areas that can be sectioned off as their own battle arenas, including some areas where you can actually fall off into the void. I think this is the only level in Twisted Metal 3 that allows that, but the big twist of Calypso's blimp is, enemies will continually respawn unless you destroy four separate panels throughout the level, and it doesn't let you know this but it forces you to explore to find the panels before you can proceed, and then you fight Primeval, who's decent but standard as boss fights go. For uniqueness of progression as well as fun level design, this is always a level I look forward to in Twisted Metal 3, and one that ends the game on a high note. I'm a sucker for subversion, and this is probably the most subversive standard level in the entire series, and it stands out in a good way because of that. This could have easily been a top 10, or even top 5 contender had it not been for, you know, the game it's part of. But hey, good news, that's the last time you have to hear me talk about that. This
This, on the other hand, is probably the second most subversive level in the entire series. Treetop Rumble from Small Brawl isn't the most interesting level in theory. It's essentially an arena in the shape of a hollowed out square with an interesting set piece on all four corners, like a trapdoor or a lawnmower for some reason. What is a lawnmower doing in a treehouse? But the square layout means that no matter where you go, you're bound to run into another competitor. But here's the interesting part. If you fall off the arena on the outside, it's an instant death. But if you fall on the inside, you'll bounce on a trampoline to the other end of the arena, making for some really good strategy as far as tactically escaping. And I know a thing or two about being tactical. So for the interesting subversive gimmick, interesting set pieces, and benefiting from the core gameplay being really fun in Small Brawl, it elevates Treetop Rumble beyond its slightly disinteresting design layout to being a great level. I really like it when games add extraneous detail that didn't need to be there. Buster's Lanes, as it sounds like, is a level in Twisted Metal Small Brawl that's a bowling alley. And I think the level's already really well designed, with multiple levels of elevation, including a lift that takes you to a top area, as well as all the added details, but it's also a level where you have a functioning bowling alley. It's not a great game, as there's no physics and the ball is a sprite, but it's still an entire thing they programmed within the level, and when you knock down all the pins, you get a free item. They didn't need to do that, but they bothered to program an entire minigame into this level that benefits the player if they participate. Adding an extra layer to the optimal playstyle in the level, and I really appreciate it. So yeah, it's a well-designed level with a fun gimmick that plays into the level progression relatively smoothly. Definitely a level worth the effort to unlock. Black Rock Stadium in Twisted Metal 2012 is where sh** gets real. It's the true final destination of 2012, except it actually has a lot of gimmicks. You have lots of electrified sh**, an upper level with ramps and roads to all sides of the arena, and even a pool of lava. Now that's hardcore. So it's not content just being a basic arena, and gives you plenty to play around with. It only has two different variations, because it's by far and away the smallest main level in the game, but it has a level of intimacy that's hard to come by in Twisted Metal 2012, making it the perfect arena to duke it out with friends in. Or just play around in. This is the opening level of Twisted Metal Black, and definitely the one you're gonna be seeing the most. Also, probably the one with the weirdest name. Zorko Brothers Scrap and Salvage. Couldn't they just go with, like, Junkyard or something? And who the hell are the Zorko Brothers? Can they be characters in the next game? And the game starts off really strong. A fairly robust level with plenty of hazards and things to explore. Plus, the overall level design has a bunch of stuff to play around in, enough to make every spot in the arena feel unique but not so much that it becomes overwhelming, with plenty of verticality, rewarding skillful maneuverability with plenty of powerful weapons and hard-to-reach areas. Plus, the environmental attack in this particular level is worth mentioning. This broken-down bomber will fire a bunch of missiles at anyone within its view. It's pretty dang overpowered and pretty fun to use as a result. Additionally, I generally like the twisted visual aesthetic of Twisted Metal Black already, but I especially like the visual aesthetic of this level because it has a dynamic storm effect that will turn up every now and again, which will completely hinder your vision. It's a great level and starts Twisted Metal Black out on the right foot. It's just a shame I couldn't place it any higher, but that's just how good some of the levels in Twisted Metal Black are. It's also worth mentioning there's a secret area you can unlock by shooting down this plane, and boy, isn't it just... fortunate that this game didn't come out a couple months later. The Moscow level in Twisted Metal 2, which I will not be referring to by its actual name, is the definition of simple but brilliant. It's a small arena with a bowl in the middle and four separate intersecting platforms connected by ramps. Small enough to be intimate while also having enough interesting ideas and set pieces that you're not left defenseless. The only criticism I could give this level is that there aren't nearly enough weapon pickups, and they could have easily put two or three more players for you to fight in the story mode, but those are fairly minor gripes. It's only the second level in Twisted Metal 2, and it's definitely something that I get a kick out of every time I play it. Drive-In Movie in Twisted Metal Black is easily one of the best levels in the entire game. Eight players packed into a tiny arena. It's a level where there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, you have to kill to stay alive. 
Plus, there are no healing pads, so no advantage to the player, putting it all down to pure skill and tactics. It's so fast-paced and so exciting. Even after a dozen or two playthroughs, this is still the level I struggle with because you have to be on your toes 100% of the time. Every time you fire a shot at one character, there are at least three other characters surrounding you at the same time. It creates a level of organic excitement that's hard to come by. That's why it's one of the best levels in Twisted Metal Black, and why I'll usually pick this level over Snowy Roads when they come up, even though it's significantly harder. As good as Snowy Roads is, it doesn't hold a candle to drive-in movie, and even then, it's not like it's a flat level. You got a couple of buildings, a couple of ramps, and a couple of projector screens. There's a lot going on in this level, and I've probably had more fond memories of drive-in movie than possibly any other level in the series. It's not so complex that I can call it the best level in the series, but it's pretty close. Even though it's a tried and tested design formula, this one just does it better than most. This is one of those levels where you can tell a heart-stopping amount of effort went into it, because it's basically two levels. You have an entire top level and an entire series of underground caverns, and I enjoy being able to explore those caverns, because it's always slightly larger and slightly more intricate than you remember it being. And the top layer level isn't bad either, with several notable landmarks, secret areas, and one of my favorite environmental attacks in the series. You have this open pit where you can summon a tornado, and getting somebody trapped in there is so satisfying. I cackled like a demon when I did this. <laughs> the more I talk about this level, the more I realize just how much I like it. It's very unsuspecting is what it is. Egypt has a lot going on, and a lot of fun design. A lot that enhances the action, and nothing that gets in the way. Just how I like it. When it comes to dynamic level changes, very few levels do it quite as well as Antarctica in Twisted Metal 2. Literally, you can sink the polar ice caps and completely alter the arena as a result. This adds an intangible excitement to the battle knowing that at any point you might need to make a run for it as everything's falling apart. I lost count of the amount of times I was just doing my thing and had to absolutely book it because the hypothetical ship was sinking under my feet. The scenery can't help but be bland because this is just a giant sheet of ice we're talking about, but Antarctica has made for some of the most exciting fights I've ever experienced in Twisted Metal, full stop. And that's the most important part. A big rooftop level as the best level in the game? I have a feeling this might be a recurring pattern. Los Angeles Skyline in Twisted Metal 2012 is a fantastic level. Multiple skyscrapers to smash your way through, a bunch of secrets to find, a central area with a giant spinning top. There's a lot going on in this level, and the imminent danger of all the deadly drops around you only adds a basting of adrenaline as you smash your way through a crowd of opponents and NPCs. Black Rock Stadium is definitely a Final Destination type arena where it cuts the crap and just pits you in a relatively small environment with everyone else. But Los Angeles Skyline manages to be flashy without being too flashy, gimmicky without being too gimmicky, explory without being too explory, and despite being big, utilizes every inch of the battlefield. It seems no matter where you are, there's something interesting that adds to the fight, even if only as window dressing. It's the best of every world, and definitely the one level I go back to more than any in Twisted Metal 2012. Don't look down because you just might fall. Rooftop combat is the final level in Twisted Metal 1 and to me easily the best. It's another one of those levels that's split into multiple parts. There's a few mostly similar rooftops and I do like to hang out on the far rooftop because there's a good chance the AI will have a brain fart and fall off. Then there's also the secret area under the pyramid, which I'm pretty sure is actually the first secret area in the entire series. Something we'd see a lot of in the later games. And you'll definitely need to unlock it, because therein lies the only healing pad in the level. Something you'll definitely need. There's just a sense of imminent danger the entire time while playing this level, and the boss fight with minions certainly adds to that. Since you're only fighting three people, it can seem a bit tame on the surface, but I'm pretty sure they gave you less people to fight because they wanted to give you as much of a shot against Minion as possible. Or possibly it's meant to give you a false sense of security before the big plain text pop up. Definitely the level I look forward to the most in the entire first game, which is good because it also follows on from the level I look forward to the least. <laughs> Thank you.
You know what I love about Prison Passage? I love the way it evolves as the level goes on. You start off in a small enclosed area with nowhere to go and nowhere to hide. So it's very easy to die, keeping you on your toes. Then you get access to the whole prison ship and things start to get a little bit more open and a little bit more vertical. Then eventually, once the ship lands, you find yourself with full access to the entirety of Blackwell Asylum. Allegedly the asylum from the prologue, but it also looks very different. But that's besides the point. It's the constant evolution that really sells this one. You get to experience the best aspects of small levels, medium levels, and large levels. It constantly feels like it's pulling new tricks from up its sleeve. And once you have access to the full island, there's plenty to explore and lots of secrets to seek. The design is varied, it has plenty of verticality and design built around getting the drop on people, a sense that no matter how much you explore there's always new things to find, and you fight a lot of people, meaning that even at its full size, there's never too much distance between you and your opponents. For what it is, I'd say it's almost perfect. Meet Your Maker from Small Brawl is such a fun level. It has multiple vertical levels of arena, lots of hazards that adds to the challenge, a good size to enemy ratio, and enough moving pieces that it keeps you on your feet. It's a very well designed level for battling, and has made for some very exciting fights, but to me it's further elevated by one of its gimmicks. You have this meat grinder, which is an instant kill if you get caught in it, and has a moving conveyor belt. So what I liked to do was camp out on the ramp nearby and freeze people who tried to come at me. That way they get torn to shreds in the meat grinder. It didn't always work, but I will not lie. I cackled like Gruntilda whenever I got this to work, which is distinct from cackling like a demon. So satisfying. So that alone elevates this level from a top 10 to a top 3. But even taking it on its own merits, this is a really great level. Abandoned Skyscrapers from Twisted Metal Black is an awesome level. It has so many ideas running through it. You have a rooftop chapel, a secret penthouse area, a wrecking ball, plenty of ramps, holes with turbines at the bottom. Despite being big, each roof feels like its own individual battleground that each feels distinct from each other, so despite being possibly the biggest level in the game, it feels like it's constantly throwing new ideas at you, keeping each encounter fresh, making it possibly the level with the best use of space per square foot in the series. And it's all brought together by the setting. Everyone loves a good setting. As the name implies, it's set at the top of a bunch of skyscrapers, so you're always having to contend with not only your own enemies, but the ever-present threat of making one mistake and falling down. It's an incredibly exciting level to play around in, and no matter where you find yourself in the level, there's never a dull moment, especially because once again they make sure to have as many enemies in play as possible. The visuals may also appear dull, but the level has a mood and an atmosphere thick as fog that you don't get very often. The entire game has a mood, but this level in particular just sticks out to me for how eerie it is. That feeling of isolation in this desolate space is great. Add to that a feeling of imminent danger around every corner and you have one hell of a level that serves as a great climax to Twisted Metal Black. One with tons of ideas, no wasted space, and no matter how many times I play it, it's always a blast. Originally, and for a very long time, I ranked this as the number one level, but there's one level I simply could not deny. The Firewalk. That's an evocative phrase. Well, in this case, it's referring to the lava-filled pits of the Amazonian rainforest. I think that's slightly unrealistic, but never mind. Originally, I didn't have Amazonia from Twisted Metal 2 placed as the top level in the entire series, but I did some soul-searching and realized that, to me, it was always the first level to come to mind whenever I think of levels in the Twisted Metal series. You may disagree, but there's something about this one that's just perfect. Lots of level architecture, lots of secrets to discover, a bunch of narrow roads connecting all these different major set pieces, and all surrounded by hot lava, which will slowly damage you, so there's a basting of adrenaline throughout this level having to navigate these pools without falling in while you're making your way around the level, finding secret areas to get the best weapons, and all while surviving and fighting against the other drivers. It's a very open level, but because your movement is theoretically restricted by the lava, it gives the level design a tightness and keeps the enemy encounters frequent. But there's also theoretically nothing restricting you from going into the lava so long as you can handle taking the damage, which adds a risk-reward element in that you can run away if you're being overwhelmed at the cost of your health. 
It's a great well-designed level with a gimmick that enhances the excitement, and it's all capped off with a reprisal of the minion boss fight from the first game, which is possibly the best minion boss fight in the series because it's hard as hell. This is a boss that does not mess around. He'll throw everything at you, and you need your wits about you in order to beat him. And when you do, it's a true accomplishment. Possibly more so than the final boss, because this is roughly as hard if not harder, and comes way earlier in the game. So once you beat Minion, nothing can stand in your way because there's never a difficulty spike that severe for the rest of the game. I think there's a reason why this is the final level in easy mode. If half the content in the game is only available to higher difficulties, there's a chance that some players may never be able to see some of the content in the game. And it would have been a crime if players didn't see this level. You may disagree, but to me, Twisted Metal 2 is peak Twisted Metal in every way possible, and Amazonia is peak Twisted Metal 2 in every way possible. Therefore, it's the best level in the series. The end. Well, that was another hour plus of all our lives down the collective tubes. I hope you enjoyed this little ranking. I do plan on doing more in the future. I might expand it to other franchises, and as for this particular series, there's still a few more things I could do. Special attacks, characters, vehicles, and so on. So let me know what you want to hear me rank next, and you don't necessarily need to keep it to this specific series. And be sure to let me know what your favorite level is in the comment section below. Did I get this list right? Did I get this list wrong? Was I too harsh on a level you like? Was I not harsh enough on a level you don't like? Leave your thoughts, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification icon so you're always up to date on what I'm doing. Seriously, it really helps the channel more than you know. Then if you want to support the channel in a more direct way, you can donate to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards such as early access, Discord benefits, and exclusive content like these fine folks right here. And an extra special thank you to, and I have a few more names today, Farmcat84, Gaw004, Raf, Brooklyn, Dbetch, and Joseph Rosas for going above and beyond. Otherwise than that, I've been the King of Snark Style right here on Tactical Bacon Productions, and I will see you next time. Peace!